He opens up another door. Another author comes through. John, you're on the spot. I We have the uh, honor of having Karen Hall join us. I have known Karen, oh, since... Uh, Oh, well, quite some time ago, uh, she was one year ahead of me at, at College of William and Mary, where she was the bomb in terms of playwrights. And uh, when at a time that I was trying to get my feet under me in writing, and I and I and I took a playwriting class with Lou Catron, who was the playwriting in, uh, professor there. And I first became aware of Karen personally when I had written a one act play, and I believe it was called Early on One Frosty Morning. And Karen kind of had the role, I guess, of teaching assistant at the time. And she gave me back my play and savaged it. I mean, it was absolutely torn to shreds. And shortly after that, I found out she got a job as a writer on MASH. And since then, we've come to know each other. And um, she had, she's had this e enormously successful writing career, first in television. I'm just going to do a few of these, MASH, Hill Street Blues, Moonlighting, uh, Eight is Enough, uh, and, and, and many more. And, I watched uh, all of those. Yes, and we all have. And, and um, So before I tell your whole story, Karen, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And, and for the record, she pretends that she does not remember the savaging of my play because she savaged so many. Oh. That's, that's true. That's true. But I, the funny thing is, I wasn't the teacher's assistant. I was just obnoxious. <laughs> <laughs> I might have appointed myself teacher's assistant. That's awesome. Uh, I, I'm so glad there's no like video of what I was like in college because it would be very painful to watch. So, and I'm sure I'm sure your play was not that bad. Oh no, I actually still have it. It it, it really deserves savaging. You you were you were you were kind actually. That's no hard feelings at all. Everybody has to start somewhere. That's right. I remember my first air check in radio. It was so bad. I I, I kept it for years just to remind myself that I was so bad <laughs> and to keep working hard. And then eventually yeah, I, I kept, tossed it. I kept all of my plays from college, and I'm always telling people that I'm helping that they are in no way as bad as I was when I was in college. So um, it's so, good, you know. That's where you start, and then you come a long way. You were quite the inspiration. Before we move to the, to the book, you were quite an inspiration for young writers everywhere. Um, tell about how you moved from writing plays in Williamsburg to writing screenplays in uh in Hollywood, in teleplays actually in Hollywood. Well, I went after William and Mary. I went one year of uh, in the graduate playwriting program at the University of Virginia, and I had this um, the guy who was the, my mentor or whatever he was supposed to be, um, and it had to, it was a two year program. You had to pass to get in the second year. So I produced a one act play, and it was a jury of three people, and they all voted to have me go to the next year and my my mentor teacher had a veto vote and so he told me that he wasn't going to pass me into the second year because I was wasting my talent writing for television or, or wanting to and so I dropped out and went to California to waste my time writing for television and um, I had met Alan Alda under a, a program I'd gone with the University of Richmond in summer school, uh, there were two teachers there who wrote about television from a sociological point of view, and we met with all the people that they had a contact with, and one of them was Alan Alda. And so I, got, I meant to listen to him talk, and I started talking to him about wanting to be a writer. So he told me when I got back to send him you know, some of my plays, and so I did. He ended up calling my sorority house, to talk to me about them, and and this, my sorority sister who answered the phone when he said he was Alan Alda said, yeah, and I'm Robert Redford, so <laughs> that's <laughs> lucky he ever got to me. But anyway, uh, I moved out to California, and um, he told me, we sat down and talked, and he told me to get ready for five years of typing and filing, and I remember telling him that I didn't have five years of that in me, <laughs> I needed to break in sooner than that. And about 11 months after I got there, I got a call from him at my job where I was typing and filing. 
and he said they wanted to put another um they wanted to add a staff writer and he wanted them to make it a woman because there had never been a female staff writer and so i went in for my interview got from that i got a freelance assignment and then they were very happy with that so then they offered me the staff job and that's that's how that happened cool uh, uh, Karen Bills, double fail. Uh, the interview, what constitutes, what goes into an interview for a staff writer? You know, the real thing they're looking for is whether or not they want to be in a room with you all day long. <laughs> and, uh, it, and that's the absolute truth. And I know because, you know, I later was in the position of hiring people. And, um, you know, like if you're the showrunner, you don't care that they're the best writer on earth because you know you can rewrite anything that has a problem. Um, you want them for generating good story ideas and uh, writing first drafts, and but mostly, I, I'd say at least 50% about it, of it is, you know, do they want to be in a room with you all day? Because being on a staff is like being married to six people. Um, it's just, it's very, uh, <laughs> you get on each other's nerves, and uh, you just spend way too much time closed in a room with each other. So, you know, that that really was what people looked for i assume that through time you became one of the interviewers and did that did that uh ob objective still hold true in later years that's what you're looking oh, for absolutely okay. absolutely um i was a showrunner on a show called judging amy and i had to hire some writers and really what i cared about is you know are they going to click with me and the other writers you know so we're in a room People always talk about the room chemistry because you're going to be spitballing ideas and you don't want somebody who's a buzzkill or who's going to shoot down everything. So you just, you're trying to find somebody who, as we call it, is one of us. It's like, you know, you're, you're with the rhythm of the room. Why are so many shows on network TV so bad? <laughs> you know what? Everything is so bad right now because, uh, they no longer are an artistic endeavor, um, and especially the streaming, because that's you know the, the people giving you notes are tech guys who really could not care less. They don't care about the art, and they don't care about the artists. And um, network television, there just came to be a point, it was after the 2008 strike, uh, there was a point where respecting writers as artists was just gone. And uh, we went from, like, before the... 2008 strike if i got a note i didn't like i didn't have to do it and after that strike i had to do every single note they gave me and you know the people who run networks have mbas they don't have they have no creative background they have no idea how to give you a note on a on a piece of writing and so that's how it all just went to hell i may know what may know what you mean when you say note i do not what do you mean with a note um, you know, they'll go through the script, turn the script into the network, and then they call you, and you have the network call with them, and they tell you, you know, you know, change this line to something else. Um, we don't like the part where this happens, so lose that. Uh, and a lot of times they would tell you to lose stuff that was setting up something later or paying off something that had already been set up, so that would make it just completely not work. But they didn't care because they didn't know what they were talking about. So in simple terms, they've gone from uh, uh, desiring quanti uh, quality, quantity over quality? You know, I don't. they don't really know anymore what quality is. And they never really did, but they let the artists, they gave them the benefit of the doubt. Um, the people who are deciding whether or not to put something on the air, it would be as if I tried to go run a bank. You know, it's like they don't have the brain for creativity, but everybody thinks that everybody thinks they're, you know, creative and, and they don't give it enough uh, respect to know that it's a craft that you have to learn. So, so let's they're, shift they're, let's shift from writing by committee to writing the your your lifetime project here. The Sound of Silence, the life and canceling of a heroic Jesuit priest. Tell us about um uh, Father Mankowski and your involvement in this project and, and what it's about. Um, okay. Father Mankowski was a Jesuit who was silenced by the Jesuits. 
And I don't know if you know anything about the Jesuits, but they're very um, – they used to be – they used to call them the Pope's Marines because, you know, they started during the Reformation, and their job was really to defend the Catholic Church. But then uh, around the – you know, when the 60s happened and, and everybody lost their minds, um, they became very modernist and, and woke, and uh, and and they don't – believe what the church teaches and they're they're pretty out there with it with admitting that and father minkowski was an old school jesuit who believed what the church had taught for two thousand years and 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 he was loud about it and he was an absolutely brilliant writer um and so he wrote a lot of articles that the jesuits hated and finally in the year 2003 he wrote an article attacking another jesuit Um, And so they silenced him. Uh, And like I said, he was a brilliant writer. He was a brilliant satirist. Um, They're just, you know, it's hard to describe him in 25 words or less because he was just a singular person. Um, And he uh, he was a philologist. He spoke 12 languages and half of them were dead. Uh, But the thing that made him so startling was that he was all of that. He was brilliant. Um, his IQ could probably double mine. Um, and he was scathingly funny, and so he was a brilliant satirist. But he also was somebody who could talk to you about NASCAR and football. Um, there aren't a lot of scholars who want to talk with you about NASCAR and football. So he was just very down-to-earth, and everybody loved him, you know, his his friends. And so um, I had a lot of his writing. We'd been writing emails to each other you know, almost daily for 14 years. And so when he died, it occurred to me that, you know, I didn't have a vow of silence and I could publish his work that wasn't published in all those years because they had silenced him. So that's why I decided to write the book. So I wanted to put his unpublished uh, articles and parodies and all of that into the book. But I also wrote about our friendship, um, it made no sense for us to be friends because when we met, he was a scholar in Rome, and he had never owned he, – he died. He was 66 years old. He never owned a television. So everything that I had done was completely meaningless to him. <laughs> um, and, and the fact that we would end up being good friends is just kind of, you know, I think God had a hand in it. Is there a formal, me- is there a formal mechanism in the church to silence someone? There is uh, for the Jesuits because um, Jesuits take a vow of obedience, to, you know, and that counts for ob- obeying their superiors. And so, you know, if they were told not to do something, they had to honor their vow of obedience and, and not do it. Did he get in trouble because of the issues he was addressing or just the fact that he was addressing issues? Because of the issues he was addressing, because, you know, what he was going after was the places where the Jesuits don't agree with the church, um, or really 2,000 years of Christianity, and so he would stand up for what the church teaches, um, and that's the last thing the Jesuits wanted to hear. Um, You know, it's very telling that we have a Jesuit pope right now who is putting out documents every five minutes that are contrary to what the church has always taught. So I always thought the Jesuits were primarily a teaching order. They are. um, And, you know, he was teaching when they silenced him, he was teaching uh, ancient languages uh, to guys in Rome who were on their way to becoming priests. Um, But he also, Jesuits also write a lot they're scholars, and uh, there are a lot of Jesuit writers. Um, there was another Jesuit who, who died before him named uh, Father James Shaw, who wrote the same kind of things that Paul did. They never silenced him. Um, I don't know why. I think I think the problem was that Paul was somebody who, uh, you know, could grow a fan club because people were really— uh, you know, really excited over him and what he was doing, and so he got a lot more attention than than the other people did. 
in practical terms, what does it mean to be silenced? They, they told him that he couldn't write under he couldn't write anything else under his byline uh, without permission from his superiors, and the only thing they would okay him to write about was uh, his area of ex- expertise, which was ancient Semitic uh, doc, uh, languages. So you know, not a lot of call for columns about that. And um, after they first told him that he couldn't write under his byline, he, he did something that was very Jesuitical, which is that he gave himself a pseudonym and kept writing. And so, but he was so brilliant that everybody could read it and know that it was him. He just, he had turns to the phrase. He, he was like, he was a big fan of, of Evelyn Waugh and was very much like him in, 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 in that he never wrote a boring sentence in his life. Um, and so people knew it was him, so the Jesuits knew it was him, and so they told him not to write under any byline, and that's when he was silenced. He wasn't allowed to go speak on anything other than ancient Semitic languages, so they really just took his voice away. How did Father Mankowski and your relationship with him influence your own journey through your faith? It really... You know, first of all, he catechized me because I had joined the church in California under Cardinal Roger Mahoney. So I thought I was a Catholic, but I wasn't. Um, and my mother-in-law, real, my mother-in-law was a third order Dominican. She was more Catholic than the Pope back when that actually meant something. And so she made me go and meet Father Mankowski because she wanted him to turn me into a real Catholic. And that's kind of what happened. He, he catechized me. Um, and also just his example really strengthened my faith, uh, made me braver than I was before that. Um, and uh, I just, I realized after he died, I thought, well, you know, how am I going to get through this quagmire without, you know, him to help me? But I realized pretty soon that I had internalized his voice, so I never feel like I can't talk to him because I know what he would say. How does a priest who is who has taken a vow to a moral life but is sometimes and we all know I'm Catholic about the lawsuits in the Catholic Church with abuse. Oh yeah. How does how does a priest who has taken a moral vow remain silent when those around him who are immoral are trying to suppress the immorality? Well, like I said, you know, he took his vows very, very seriously, and, and that included the vow of obedience. So he had to obey his superior. Um, and I, it, you know, it, it wasn't it wasn't good, but he had a group of friends that I I was one of, and he would write to us, and um, you know, and we were people who were like I had. I had a voice because I was a writer, and a lot of other people were priests, so they had a voice, so, you know, we could stand up for him. Um, but I'm sure it was really hard on him, but uh, he really believed that that his salvation was dependent on him keeping the vows that he took, and so that's why he did. He died in September of 2020. Was it of COVID, or was uh, were the conditions of his death related to the stress induced from this situation? I, I think so. He he had a brain aneurysm, and you know his closest friends think that uh, it was from the stress he had been under for so long. How has you know, it? There's no way. There's no way to know that, but it makes sense to me. How has your your book been received by the church? Um. I've been really surprised at how well it's done, and, you know, I don't know how it's been received by the official church. Um, Thank God the Pope hasn't mentioned it, but uh, I've gotten so many letters from priests thanking me for writing the book. Um, I've made a lot of new priest friends now, and it's just, it's been so well received. I thought when I was writing it, I thought, you know, this book will be read by 11 people who already agree with me. <laughs> and it, the weekend that it came out, it came out on, a, I think, a Tuesday. And by noon of the day that it came out, it was sold out everywhere. You could not find it. 
It was sold out at Amazon and all the other sold out at Ingram, the place that supplies the bookstores. And um, I was just shocked. And and I continue to be shocked because it continues to have high ratings on Amazon. So I've, I've been very happy with how it's been received. John Gilstrap. One minute left. Wrap it up. And the name of the book is The Sound of Silence, The Life and Canceling of a Heroic Jesuit Priest by Karen Hall. Uh, I, it's Any last words? you got like 40 seconds to put in your last pitch here, Karen. Make it 30. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm told that the book is a page turner, so it's not a slog fest, and, and partly because he was so funny and it's full of our emails. Um, and, and I also have had comments from people who aren't Catholic who really enjoyed the book. One of my friends is Jewish and he really enjoyed the book so I think it has a lot to say about modernism and, and what we're currently going through. Karen, thank uh, you so much for your time this morning. Much appreciated. Best of luck with the book. Thank you so much. Great luck. Bye. Karen Hall at 9 uh, 57.